Continuing on from last week, uh, tonal security, there's quite a lot to cover uh, last week. We didn't touch every base. So for those that are here, it was not many of us, but hopefully some of you guys that uh, will be able to watch the live stream last week. So we're continuing on. So, tonal security continued. So I'm just going to quickly recap uh, from last week what we went through. So we went through some proof text. We didn't use all the everlasting life verses or eternal life verses, but we went through, through a few of them. Like, um, basically, where whosoever drink of this water shall never thirst. Uh, whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again. Whosoever the drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And it all those verses, you know, I would never, uh, I would not lose, I should not lose him, I will not cast him out, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So, a lot of proof texts, Romans 5.20, and so, so forth and such, right? And then we see last week also the dual nature. We explained that some people mix the two of the new man and the old man, that in Romans 7, what we see is Paul actually having that warfare between the two in Romans 7. Uh, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writing that, you know, even he himself had that, uh, the two fighting natures between the flesh and the spirit. So the new man, the new creature, and the old man are the, the things of the old in the flesh. And we have the punishments and rewards. So we saw in 1 Corinthians 11 that uh, all his works were burned, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So that person whether he built up things on Christ for eternal matters or things of this world. They got burnt up, right? And we know that uh, if you even give a little cup, uh, if you give a cup in the, in the Lord's name, you should not lose his reward. So if you can lose your salvation, you can lose your rewards, which wouldn't make sense. Then we went through some objections, lost and found in Luke 15. I do think it's not necessarily talking about salvation because that's also the same chapter about, as we went through last week, the, the prodigal son. So you have the, the lost sheep and the found and the coin that was lost and found as well. But uh, when we see the prodigal son, the son himself, he's still called a son. And obviously the father was there waiting for him. And we know by, by in, in John chapter 1, that if you believe on Christ, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So if he's not saved, then he can't be the father. So that's uh, what I see Luke 15 to say. Because a coin doesn't have a conscience, a coin doesn't lose itself, but it yet is found. So it's always referring to God seeking uh, to save that which is lost, right? Uh, so just like us as, as believers, we go out into the world sometimes, you know, God is waiting. God is waiting for you to come back to Him. And so He's willing to, He's waiting, He's looking for that person. Once you hit rock bottom, you know, out of the miry pit, out of the miry clay, out of the pit, that God will wait for you and bring you up. Then we saw the virgins and stewards, uh, the ten virgins, and we saw that uh, the, the oil represented Christ, we saw that the five ones, uh, the five that were ready, they had the oil, and the virgins that had no oil actually went and bought, so that's sort of a picture of them working for it, and they also said, Lord, Lord, and Jesus says, I never knew you, right, and then we see the stewards as well, uh, that we see there was the two, that what I see, what we see is uh, basically them building up on their faith, from faith to faith as we throughout, see throughout the New Testament, but that the, the steward that was unjust, right, he hit, went and hit it, and he's not even willing to give it to people that work for him, which is like the people uh, in interest, basically. Like they give, he gives it to the banks, that they would uh, increase that with their own works. Not the steward's work, but the person that he's willing to put the money to. So he was not even willing to give it to someone that was willing to work for them. And John 15, he was cast forth as a branch, so went through a few of that, that sometimes even in, as we see in Numbers 11, God, just for people complaining, he burnt them up and, he's, and uh, the, anger, the kindle of his anger was, uh, was lit up. And then we went through some common phrases, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which would be from Philippians 2, which is obviously, uh, when you read it, it's about, we see Christ being the servant, even though he's, uh, even though he's equal with God, uh, made, made himself of no reputation but put him upon himself, uh, the, the form of a servant. And likewise, so that should be like us, that as believers, we should work outwardly our salvation to every man with fear and trembling. Phrases, you have fallen from grace, in Galatians, that these people that say you can lose your salvation, they're saying, if you're not adding works to salvation, you've lost, your fa uh, you've lost salvation. But Paul is saying the opposite. They're saying, hey, you, you 
You're adding works to your salvation, that's why I think you're not saved. So, contrary to what they believe. Spew thee out of my mouth, that if you're lukewarm, God is going to spew out of his mouth. But we know there's also cold. Does God want you to be cold? He says, I want you to either be cold or hot. So, does God want you to be unsaved? But we know that's not the case. The Bible says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Uh, the next phrase we saw is, neither will your father forgive you. And once again, we, we see the word father there. If he's not saved, he's not your father. So obviously it's something pertaining to the flesh. Uh, if, if you haven't forgiven your brother in Christ, you know, in the, the things in the flesh, God will not forgive you. And he's not your father if you're not saved. And him will I blot out of my book. We know that it's basically in Revelation that if you've overcome, uh, he, he will he'll give you white raiment. He will not blot you out of his book. He'll confess you uh, before the Father and His angels, which is what the, you know, we, the song we sang in the first and opening, you know, it talks about in the last verse we saw. Uh, overcometh, he that overcometh. Right, and we know who that, who, we know that um, the person that overcomes is the one that believes on Christ, as uh, we saw in First John. So if you believe on Him, who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So that's some of the phrases, that's what we went through last week. And I just want to quickly go through some missed points before I go to Hebrews 6. And I feel bad because this one's a really popular one. A lot of people say this, that you can lose your salvation. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And people point to that and say, see, you have to endure to the very end. That you, all the way to the end, you have to work for God. Right? But we know in context, in Matthew 24 and Matthew 10, let's go through. It's obviously talking about end times. Uh, and let's see what happens here. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver you up, the brother to death, and the father the children. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And this is the part we, they like to point to. But he that endureth to the end the same... Uh, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So that's in Matthew 10. And we did read Matthew 24 earlier. But the context, uh, when you read before, when he gets up to that, you know, it's, it's about people persecuting you, right? People delivering you up to the governors and that you will be persecuted, you'll be put to death. And so this is what it's referring to, that if you're going to endure to the end, you know, blessed is he that make it to, to that point, to that rapture point, you know, it's not, talking about, it's not talking about your works, that you have to endure to the end with your works. It's talking about the person that if they survive to the end of this great tribulation, that person will be saved. So that's a physical thing, not a spiritual salvation. And people will, will persecute you. And that's, that's something we all have to be aware of, you know, uh, as believers. Now one day we'll be persecuted in, in the great, with the great tribulation. So that's what it is to endure to the end. Another one that they like to use is, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so we see at the end of there, uh, who, who are these people that he's, he's contrasting it to? Christ, uh, Paul is saying, you know, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, such was some of us. But that phrase, I like how it says, but ye are sanctified, and, but ye are justified. You can cross-reference that with uh, Bible verses, of, obviously, about salvation. Romans 4, 6, popular one to many of us. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So when remember... The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, it's talking about works there. But when you jump into Romans 4, 6, uh, it talks about God imputing His righteousness without the works. So without all those, you know, if, you, if you're not a fornicator, you're keeping the works that you're not fornicating. Likewise with all the others. If you're not, if you're not doing idolatry, you're keeping the law. 
That's doing works. Right, so how are we righteous? God imputed that righteousness without works when you believe on Christ. Right, so that's the people who are righteous. Now, what else does it say um, about the flesh, right? We see in 1 Corinthians 15, Now I, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, you know, the physical things, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit corruption. But I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we are, shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So physically, this is speaking physically, and this would make sense in, in, in light of uh, 1 Corinthians 6. It's talking about, you know, the works of the law. Uh, if you keep it, you're not one of these people. But we are, we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified by believing on Christ as we see. And that's without works. Right, so physically, we cannot enter into heaven. The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but we will be changed. Uh, and so we also see this, I like this verse in Revelations 3, you know, when, when people try to say you can lose your salvation by doing the works, you know, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're unrighteous, you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. But we see this in Revelations 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, you know, that's when you're saved, and yet, and ye now are made perfect by the flesh? So it's, it goes hand in hand with the verses we just saw prior, you know, that we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye, that our, our flesh and blood will be changed. And we are saved because of the righteousness God imputes unto us by faith. So that's what it is. Those two I just wanted to quickly touch on, that uh, he that endureth to the end and unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, so I want to jump into now the um, Hebrews 6, the text verse today. I did want to jump into Hebrews 10 as well, but I don't think we'll have time. Uh, Hebrews 6, a lot of people like to jump into this. But when I, went, when I went through this, I actually had a change of mind about this, uh, what I believed prior. Hebrews 6. But let's point to what people say. If you, you can lose your salvation. Let's read it in the mindset that you can lose your salvation. And you might read this and like, hey, that's a pretty good, good proof text. So let's read it. Uh, Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for, the, uh, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So they point to that. Uh, end is to be burned and they see that it's these people that did all these things with God that they will be burned whose end is to be, to be burned so that's what they say you know all these people you know they're, they're enlightened they know God's word they, they serve God and they have tasted of the heavenly gift they, they ate basically is what they're saying and we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost you know, remember in Acts when they're, they're all speaking in tongues and healing and all these other uh, miracles and signs you know, they made, were made partakers of that and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So these people, they say the reference, verse 4 and 5, that these people that were serving God were saved, and, and, but uh, if they shall, they'll fall away and whose end is to be burned. But uh, before we go on, uh, that's, what they, that's usually what they say, right? But within, even within Hebrews, we see salvation by faith and that you can never lose it. Right? It's a very common theme in Hebrews about Christ's sacrifice, but it says this in Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So uttermost. And God, we know, he's a me Jesus Christ is our mediator, he, uh, for he's a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. So although we still in the flesh do wrong, Christ, his righteousness is upon us, and Christ is saying, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, un he's clean. He hasn't done any wrong. Right? That's what Christ does for us. And we also see this in Hebrews 10. Uh, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily and ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice 
for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. I like that. They were saved once forever. You know, his sacrifice was once for all, and all of our sins paid once forever. From henceforth, expect until his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So we are sanctified, we are saved, all of our sins are paid for once for all when we have believed on Jesus Christ. And that should say amen to everyone, right? I'm thankful for God that we are saved once and through his sacrifice. But that's what we see in Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 7, you know, to the uttermost that Christ has paid for every sin. To the uttermost is not leaving one, right? So Hebrews 6, let's see what it says, because they, they like to say that these are people um, that lost their salvation, which I don't think that's the case, but there's two ways to understand Hebrews 6, or two ways that I would believe to understand Hebrews 6. And one would be that these people are just apostasy, that they went, you know, if you think about who Hebrews were, there were obviously people that were Jew, people of um, Judaism, they practiced a lot of the things of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, right? They were still probably doing sacrifices and keeping the law of Moses in, in various ways. So that's who the writer to Hebrews was addressing. These people that now have come to faith and near Jesus Christ, they were practicing the law of Moses, but they understand what God has done. Uh, that's who the writer of Hebrews is addressing to. But let's read uh, before Hebrews 6. Let's get, a, let's get a backdrop of Hebrews 5, the end of Hebrews 5, and we'll read it to that passage we saw in Hebrews 6. And we'll just read. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those by who, uh, who by reason of use have their senses exercised, to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, who are made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that, uh, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing whose end to be burned. So what's it saying? Well, let's just have a quick recap. So Paul, oh, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews is saying, you know, to be, you know, People, you, some of you guys are still in the milk of the word. You know, you ought to be teachers now. And you should start, start striving for the strong meat to be uh, to them that of, of full age. Right? So at the end of uh, Hebrews 5, he's talking about the milk of the word. You guys got to be teachers now. Be in strong meat. And that's why he says in the beginning of Hebrews 6.1, you know, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And he talks about, you know, the basic things uh, that believers should know. Uh, and, and so... It is impossible, you know, for these people, he goes on to explain who these people are, that are once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, but may partake of the Holy Ghost. If they shall fall away, to renew them to repentance. So that's all the, the things that I want to touch on uh, and bring up to in Hebrews 6. All right, so this is what I want to address in Hebrews 6. Impossible for those, and he gives a list. If they shall fall away, renew them again unto repentance. So that's the three things that we saw in Hebrews 6 that we I want to outline but we see in Hebrews throughout the Hebrews you know the book of Hebrews this is the theme that Jesus is better that we should ought to continue to grow in the faith else you will fall back to, into the old ways of Judaism or unbelief and but he's always saying look to Jesus that's sort of the the two that we see oh the sorry the four that we see the theme of Hebrews that Jesus is better than the angels he's better than Moses he's better than Joshua uh, he's better than the the priest the high priest He's better than the sacrifices. And so we believe in Jesus and we ought to grow in the faith. Otherwise, you'll fall back, right? You'll draw back. But to always look to Jesus. And not only is this a theme in Hebrews, but we see this in, throughout the New Testament. Paul is always admonishing people to continue to grow in the faith. Uh, and uh, that's why I think in Romans 1.17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, you believe in Christ, you have that foundation, and you build on that faith by serving God. 
right? Hebrew, and we see this a lot through Hebrews, and we'll read it through a few passages of Hebrews itself just to see that. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort, it, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Right, so once again, continuing to build on your faith, Hebrews 4. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man shall fall after the same example of unbelief. Once again, we should labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Uh, lest any man shall fall. I was just reading the verse there. I think it's quite uh, self explanatory. Hebrews 6 and says the same thing. And we desire that everyone you, uh, every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he attained the promise. Hebrews 10. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So, talking to, say, people, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he, that, for he is faithful that, that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And it goes into... If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the, of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire and indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So he's warning us that, hey, you know, we should, with a true heart, full assurance, continue serving God, hold fast that profession, and to encourage each other. You know, that's sort of the theme that we see after showing who Christ is, what he's done for us, that we ought to be steadfast in the faith. Otherwise, you know, when you draw back, we're going to see the punishment of God. Right? I'll address Hebrews 10 in another sermon, but we'll get to that. And we even see that in the Hall of Faith, right? The Hall of Faith, you go to Hebrews 11. Uh, the beginning of Hebrews 11 talk, gives you the definitions of faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then you see all the people in, in Hebrews 11, what they did for their faith. They built on it, you know. So we see that uh, throughout the New Testament, we see that in Hebrews. And I think this is what it's talking about in Hebrews 6, that as saved believers... We should continue, we should be steadfast with full assurance, always serving God, and also encouraging one another. And that's why we're not all to miss church. Church is important. We ought to be here to encourage each other and to love and to good, to provoke and to love, uh, to, uh, to each other to love and good works. So we shouldn't miss church, even if you're a bit sick. You know, we're not calling sickies. Uh, we're not calling, um, you know, we're not going to things of this world, but we're, we're looking and uh, serving God, helping each other to grow in the faith. And that's the warning we see in Hebrews 10. So let's jump back to Hebrews 6 and let's address... Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, this point as well. If you, I forgot who, who pointed this out to me, but if you look at impossible in, in Hebrews or possible, uh, it opens up a few times, but it shows us uh, the first covenant in Hebrews 10.4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goat, of goats should take away sins. So that would have been the first covenant that uh, under the, work, uh, the laws of Moses, right? But we see in Hebrews 11.6... By faith, the second one, if you believe in Christ. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a reward of them that diligently seek Him. So there is a faith to faith that we see. And that's the common theme we see in Hebrews, that Jesus is better. So if you believe in Him, continue to grow into faith. You know, not to, that you should be in the strong word now, strong meat. That you're still in the milk, but you should be, ought to be teachers now. So you should ought to grow now from living the foundations of, the, of Christ. Else you will fall back into the old ways of Judaism, of unbelief, and always to look to Jesus. All right, so that's what we see, the theme. that He's, he's, uh, he's talking to believers, is what I see. People that were of Hebrews that now believed on Christ. Now these are believers. So that's the one way you can think of it, is that these people are now saved, but they just gone apostate. They went back to Judaism. And so let's just a few of these, let's see these verses play out. Uh, let's see how this plays out, the apostasy of believers, right? Impossible for those, let's address those. Who are those people? Who are those people uh, that are saved? And, and I'm trying to read this in, in light of that. These people are saved, all right? For, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, 
So I, I'm going to say, if I'm going to read this in the, in the, in the mindset that these people are saved, enlightened, I'm going to say in this way that these people are saved. And we'll go through it. And so who are these people who were once enlightened? And interestingly, uh, I haven't searched enlightened. I just went enlightened. Did you see it? It's found six times in the Bible. And we'll see a few of them. And what I like about uh, 1 Samuel 14, which is what we'll jump into, it shows that someone that was enlightened, Jonathan, and uh, that he tasted. So 1 Samuel 14, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until, the, until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. So Saul, the king, he's saying uh, not to eat any food until pe or the, the Philistines be be, be peni uh, pun punished. And all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And when the people were coming to the wood, behold, the honey dropped, but no man put his hand to, the, to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. So these guys, you know, they were, they were probably hungry, as we'll see, read soon, they saw honey, they're like, oh man, like, I'm scared, I'm, I'd rather, would I rather die or have this food? Jonathan heard not when his father had charged the people with the earth, wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it into a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. Then answered one of the people that, and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. And then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes were, have been enlightened because I have tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if happily the people had eaten freely today, of the spoil of the enemies which they found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. So Jonathan, he didn't hear the command of, the, of uh, Saul. So he went and dipped uh, with his rod. You know, he, took, he, he pointed, he uh, picked out the honey and had a taste of it. And his eyes were enlightened. But all the people around him, they're like, what? Didn't you know your dad uh, said he's going to kill the person that eats today? And uh, Jonathan then says, you know, He's troubled the land. He's troubled the people, the armies, right? And so we see now Saul, he hearing this, draw ye near hither all the chief of the people and know and see wherein this sin hath this been this day. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. So people held their peace. They didn't want to, they didn't want to rat out Jonathan, right? Because it's his son. But Saul said, even if it was his son, he's going to die. I'm, I'm going to hold my commandment to the end. But then we see the, the back and forth between son and, Saul and Jonathan. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. And lo, I must die. And Saul answered, God do so and more, so, and more also. For thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. And the people said unto Saul, shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day, so the people rescued Jonathan. Uh, so it seems like Jonathan, in the end, you know, he was saved. And he was even, he was helping people bring salvation, right? Who hath wrought uh, this great salvation in Israel. And I'd like to draw back to Hebrews 6, where he was partaker of the Holy Ghost. So as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. So I like that parallel from Hebrews 6 to 1 Samuel 14. That someone that tasted was enlightened. He was a partaker in, in helping Israel beat the Philistines. And he didn't die. Right? So let's continue on. Let's, let's see a few more examples of enlightened. In Job 33. He shall pray unto God. And he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto his man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which is right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. So we see in Job 33, obviously his Old Testament, but he's... It's showing us like in a prophetic, prophetic sense that of salvation by faith, right? And uh, that we see um, in verse 28, He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Though all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. So a lot of people will be saved when they, when they trust in Christ to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. 
So once again, I see in Hebrews 6, someone that's being saved. If I'm going to read it uh, and cross-reference what lightened is, I can see that maybe yeah, it's referring to people that are saved. All right. So let's look into another one about enlightened. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, I'm just jumping here for context because I want to show you that Ephesians 1, he's, refer he's talking to saved believers. He's talking to believers. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Father, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So, who are the people that were enlightened? It's the people that had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see. So I believe when you read Hebrews 6, it's, it's still defensible to say these people were enlightened that are saved. These enlightened people, they are saved. Now, that's who we address, the, those who were once enlightened. Let's talk about now the tasted, who have, and have tasted the heavenly gifts. So tasted, he tasted three things. He tasted the heavenly gift, he tasted the good word, and tasted the powers of the world to come. And so you just have to address taste, right? And some people would say, uh, taste is just a little sample. They only taste, like we saw in Jonathan, that he tasted a little bit, and then his eyes were enlightened. So they say he didn't really eat it, he just tasted it. He had a little sample, had a little taste. Uh, but we see in Hebrews 2.9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So Jesus didn't partially die, right? He didn't, he wasn't just... It wasn't just his hands and feet that died, obviously. He, he died to the, the full extent of what death is. And he, remember in Revelation, it says, I am he that liveth and was dead and alive forevermore. And Jesus did die. He didn't just have a little taste of death, uh, like a little sample of death, but he tasted death in the, in the full sense. that he, had, he died. All right, so that's what we see um, about um, these people that were tasted the heavenly gift, that tasted the good words. They ate of it. They they fully experienced it. They immersed themselves just like Jesus immersed himself in death. That he tasted death for every man. So we see who those were enlightened. Though it sort of can be addressed to believers. And that, the, that they have tasted. They've fully immersed themselves in, in, in what Christ has done. What Christ does. Oh, sorry, through the Holy Ghost. So we address number one. I want to address number two and three at the same time. I think it sort of goes hand in hand. Uh, so I'm going to just fall away and re renew them again unto repentance. And just give you a heads up. I believe it's not repentance to salvation. It's just like as believers, if we've got any uh, things that we, lay, that we should ought to lay aside every weight, right? And a sin which doth so easily beset us. So it's repentance to serve God. Once again, if you're a believer. So let's go and address those two. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. So I'm going to address the fall away. And what I found in, in searching for fall away, and I think there is fallen away, I didn't bring that up, but you only see this another time mentioned in the Bible in Luke 8, 13 about the sower. So let's read that, and we'll have a few cross-references but we'll see uh, who the fall away is. Right? And they, are, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believed, and in time of temptation fall away. What we saw in Hebrews 6, if they shall fall away, so let's read the parable. And when much people were gathered together and, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A soul went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said, these things he cried, his, he, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus gave the parable of the sower and uh, the four examples of the seed, what happened to them. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. Now Jesus begins to explain it. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil. And taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They are on the rock, are they? 
which when they hear, this is referring to the people that fall away as well, they are the rock of they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believed, and in time of temptation fall away. So that's the stony ground here, the rock, right? In time of temptation they fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring forth and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So there's four instances of the seed. The first one, obviously, we say is not saved, but the next three, on the rock, on the thorns, and on the good ground, we, we would say they are saved. Some people would contend that. Only the last one is saved and the first three aren't. But I don't think that would be the case because he was sprung up on the rock, right? He had no, not much depth of earth. And we'll, let's bring up a parallel uh, sower. Uh, same, same parable, but from Mark. It's also in Matthew, but we'll just read the Mark one. Hark and behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground. This is the one that fell away, right? The stony ground or the one that fell on a rock, where it had not much earth, and, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And when it, but when it was sprung up, when it, but when the sun was up, it was scorched because it had no root, and it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and, it, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up, and increased and brought forth some 60 and some, some 30, and some 60 and some 100. All right, so now he begins to explain it. And so let's just jump to verse 16, just to, um, for a second time. And these are they likewise which are sown on the stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive the with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endured but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So that's the person that was fallen away, the one that was uh, sown on stony ground. What happened to them? They, they, fear, they saw persecution. Right, and then there they were immediately offended. So these guys, and we saw it earlier in Luke, um, that what happened to them? Um, that they were scorched as well. Let's jump back to Luke. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away, and it lacked moisture. Oh, sorry. Where was I jumping? Um, but it talks about them being scorched uh, because they, they didn't have much earth, right? <clears throat> Let me try to find the verse. Um, maybe, maybe it was in... Oh, sorry, it's in Mark. Sorry, earlier in Mark. <laughs> there it goes. Mark, uh, verse 5, Then some fell on stony ground. So the one that was on the rock. And verse 6, it talks about, But when it was sun it was up, it was scorched. So guys, so yeah, so the person we see that was fallen away was on stone, it didn't have a, it didn't have a depth of earth, but it was scorched as well when the sun was up, and, and I want to draw to that later on when we go back to Hebrews 6, Mark chapter 4 verse 6, alright, so let's go back to where we were, and just have a quick recap, so the stony ground, what happened, they sprang up immediately, didn't have a depth of earth, they saw affliction and persecution, and also the sun came up and scorched it. And I also want to draw to the thorny ground because remember in Hebrews 6, he says if, you, if, you're, if you're bearing thorny, uh, thorns and briars, you know, you're going to be uh, burned up. And so what we see in the thorny grounds, they, th they grew up and choked it. The thorns grew. And the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things is what uh, they, that we see in the thorns and the, and the briars. Well, I'll touch on that too when we see at the end of the, the, the sermon about the thorns and the briars. But the stony ground here is the one that fell fall away that we see that we cross-reference in Hebrews 6. If they shall fall away, and in Luke, four, in, in Luke it talks about how uh, they shall fall away. And so what we saw is, is the very thing, that they sprang up in the affliction and persecution, and the sun came up and scorched it. So I think it's a good indication that these are people that are saved, fall away, that they, they received it with gladness for a short time, and then they saw persecution, and then they were scorched. So let's continue on. Uh, and this is the other thing that I want to bring up in Hebrews 6, 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. So we saw also in the, in the sower, um, those were that were sown among thorns. 
And you'll see what thorns and briars are. You see thorns and briars throughout the Bible. Thorns and briars, thorns and thistles. Um, very common wording there. Thorns and thistles, thorns and briars. And whose end is to be burned. So the sower, which sowed among the thorns, uh, I'd say would be referencing also this in Hebrews 6 8. Oh, sorry, the other way around. This person would be referencing uh, the sower of the thorns and the, and, the, and the briars. So this is what I saw with some thorns. Obviously, we know what thorns are and the roses. This is what would be uh, the briars, some little, uh, little, I guess it would be little fruit, but they have some thorns in their stems, right? That's what we see in thorns and briars, thorns and thistles is what a thistle would look like. Um, once again, a prickly plant, right? And so if you remember, what happens to them? Whose end is to be burned. So if you're cross-referencing Hebrews 6 to the sow of the seeds, uh, and we see that these guys were, were saved, they were just drawn away to the world, or they were drawn away because of persecution. And we see whose end is to be burned. What happens, what we saw, when, if you remember what I addressed last week, uh, about God just using burning as a judgment, and not necessarily to unsaved people, but even to reference to believers. I would say as well that it's just a judgment, not necessarily to unsaved, but it can be used as a reference to believers as well. And God is here in Numbers 11 punishing people just for complaining. And I brought this up last week, but we'll go through it again. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And we wouldn't say people that were complaining, like, we wouldn't say people that are reprobate are like, we wouldn't say, sorry, we wouldn't say people that complain are now reprobate, right? Like, everyone complains to a degree, but in this instance, you know, it displeased the Lord, and the, heard, and the Lord heard it, and He burnt them, right? His, his anger burnt among them. To the uttermost parts of the camp. So complaining, just even by complaining, not even uh, sodomy, not even worshipping other idols and gods, it's just by complaining God burnt them. And so I wouldn't see that as, that's just like us, you know, sometimes we complain and God can judge us. Isaiah 9, uh, I just want to jump back to this verse first until we go a bit further. The Lord hath sent a word into Jacob and it hath lightened upon Israel. For wickedness burneth as a fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, as we saw in Hebrews 6 and also in the sower, and shall, shall kindle the, in the thickets of the forest and they shall mount up like the lifting up of the smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. So I believe he's speaking to the people of Israel, not to the other nations around them. And so he's burning them. Right, that's just the judgment of God. So we, we saw uh, who we just who those uh, who the impossible was. Uh, those, sorry, those who, those who, uh, those, the definition of those. If they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance. So just by recap, that I believe, if I was to read this in a sense of that they are saved, uh, that they actually did partake, they tasted it, they partook of the Holy Ghost, they knew, and they were enlightened, but that they just went apostate, they went to, uh, they went back to Judaism, they started sacrificing again, they started following the ways and the laws of Moses, it's impossible for these guys, you know, they, they face persecution as we saw in, in the soul and the seed, that they face persecution, and then now they were offended. They, they don't want to come back. It's possible for those people to be renewed again unto repentance. So these believers, that they've heard Christ, they know who Christ is, they're now saved. And if you think about it this way, uh, I'm not a, I was never a Roman Catholic when I grew up. My wife would have been. But people, you know, when, they, when you're practicing like little physical ordinances, when you go like to the Catholic church, you'd pray, uh, you do a lot of physical things, you take the bread and the wine nearly weekly, or you take mass, right? It's all physical, it's sort of in, in, in intertwined, it sort of becomes into your core of what you believe. And likewise, these Hebrews, right, these people that were believers of, that followed the laws of Moses, they would, have, they would have done sacrifices, they would have followed the law of Moses, it would have been entwined with what they believed to the very core. And so, now that they've gone to um, believe in Christ, you know, all these things that they don't have to follow, it's probably missing in their lives. They're thinking, like, is it really this easy? Is it really that I don't have to do all these things that Christ did indeed? Uh, took away all these sacraments, took away all the, uh, the, the laws that made us separate from the other nations. So maybe in the flesh, you know, people can be drawn away again, once again. They think, like, you know, I think it's not, uh, not this easy. I have to go back. You know, it's not just Christ alone. I have to go back into 
to doing the laws of Moses. And we see this throughout the, the, the New Testament as well. You know, Paul himself was even caught up, uh, Peter himself was caught up into these things. Paul himself, although he knew he was a, as the apostle to the Gentiles, that uh, he, he circumcised Timothy, and he, even though he knew he shouldn't, and yet uh, that's pertaining to flesh. And I find it interesting that he had a thorn in the flesh, right? So it's, it's always through the New Testament that they were addressing uh, people that were Judaism, or people of Judaism, right? That they were trying to impose the law of Moses. And these people, they fall away, it's impossible to bring them again to repentance. So though they are saved, it's impossible for them to again to be renewed into repentance, to serve God in the full assurance that, you know, it's not, it's not the works of the, or the laws of Moses. I just have to trust in Christ. All right. Now, quickly, I just want to uh, also defend that this person is not a believer. Hebrews 6 is talk, not talking about someone that's a believer. Um, so I'm going to try to defend this position as well. And I'll be, try, try to be very quick. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So tasted, once again, we, we saw earlier tasted, what Jesus Christ tasted of death of all men, that he didn't partially die, but he did experience death to the fullest. Uh, but we see here in Matthew 24, 37, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gold. This is Christ on the cross. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. So he wouldn't drink. He didn't take it fully. He didn't uh, eat it fully, right? He just tasted it. And so we can cross reference that and say, this person just tasted it. He didn't fully, he didn't eat of it. He didn't drink of it. He just tasted of the heavenly gift. So people can use this reference and defend that position that, you know, these guys just tasted the heavenly gift, tasted the good word. They didn't fully eat it. They didn't fully, as uh, John 6 would say, uh, eat of the bread and drink of the water. Uh, so you can defend that position. Hey, these guys just tasted it. They're not really saved. They're just experiencing it. Um, they, they're not really saved. So partakers of the Holy Ghost. And uh, let's see a few instances where the Holy Ghost can work to even unsaved people. Right? And we see this in 2 John, 2 John 1. Uh, so I just want to show you that this person even um, do the deed, but he's made a partaker, right? If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth God, him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So he didn't even do it. He's just saying, you know, God bless you, God's speed. But uh, John is saying, you know, you're, you're doing it like, you're saying that is like you partaking to what he does, his evil deeds. So he's, although he didn't do it, he's a partaker of it. Just like the partake of the Holy Ghost. He didn't really partake of it. He's just someone there uh, that um, was like unto it. And also that the Holy Ghost works through unsaved people. That, that can happen, right? And one of them named Caiaphas, you know, the high priest, being the high priest that same year said unto them, you know nothing at all. Now consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for all people and that the whole nation perish not. And Caiaphas, and this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. So Caiaphas, not even saved, uh, obviously didn't trust and believe in Christ, He's prophesying that Jesus should die for that nation. And we see also the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost working before us, to trying to, to work in people's hearts that aren't saved. Verse 8, And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness and of judgment of sin, because they believe not on Me. So people, the Holy Spirit is working against them, working in their hearts, you know, trying to make them understand, to bring them to Christ. Of righteousness, because I go to My Father and see Me no more. So the Holy Spirit can work uh, and un unsaved people. So that's why you can be a partaker of the Holy Ghost and not be saved. Right? So, but that which beareth thorns and briars also. I'm going to quickly address this and we'll basically be done. Uh, 2 Samuel 23 Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he hath made me with an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial, so people that now. Um, I'd say would not be saved, shall be, sorry, an image of not someone saved, shall be the, them as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of the spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. That's the sons of Belial. Right? So a picture of someone that wouldn't be saved, and yet they are burned. And they're thorns thrust away. All right? So that's how you can sort of defend that these people are not saved. They were never saved, but the Holy Spirit, they can taste of it. They can be a partaker of the Holy Ghost. 
but they are, they're not necessarily saved. And you can use those uh, verses. So I'm happy to take those two positions. Uh, these people are saved, they're just going apostate, or these people aren't saved, uh, and just being partakers, just tasting. But already, we saw that you can't lose salvation in Hebrews, Hebrews 7.25. Um, save them to the uttermost, then that come unto God by Him. And Hebrews 10, which is what we saw, that by one offering, He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So some closing thoughts. Um, and a lot of people that when you talk about losing your salvation, it's always about your works, like people showing how, how good you are, like, you know, show us your works. And that's physical, right? That's things in the outward. And that's what we see in James 2, you know, show, show me your faith by your works. But that's on the outward, that's why we see it in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man, like us, we look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Only God can know who is really saved. We can sort of have an understanding who may or may not be saved by what they say. You know, the false prophets. We shall know them by their fruits, the fruit of their lips. Right? But we look on, ultimately, we as men look on the outward side. Look on the outward appearance. We don't know who is saved in the heart. It's what we see in Romans 10.10. 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we, we can't see the heart. We don't know. We, we can't say, you know, this guy has no work. He's not saved. And that's what these people are saying you can lose your salvation for. And that's why I like to draw back to Galatians 3.3. And I'll close with this. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? We can't be made perfect by the flesh. We're only made perfect, as we saw in Hebrews 10, for you have perfected forever them that are sanctified. And that's only through Christ. So hopefully that helps you sort of defend Hebrews 6 in a way that's not... You can't lose your salvation. We know in Hebrews 7.25, Hebrews 10.10-14, 10 to 14, you cannot lose your salvation. But those are ways you can talk about what Hebrews 6 is talking about. That if people that are saved, yes, they've tasted it in the, in the sense that Jesus tasted death and they were uh, enlightened. But now that through persecution of people of Hebrews that were Judaizers, that they are bringing them back to the law of Moses and they've gone apostate. It's impossible for these guys, you know, that were practicing... Uh, the law of Moses, now that they believe in Christ and now they are going back, it's impossible for them to come back. But also, you can defend it that they are not saved, that they just tasted it, they didn't eat it like Christ uh, didn't eat it on the cross of the, the vinegar. They were made partakers in that the Holy Ghost can work in unsaved people and that they can be burnt. All right, so hopefully that can help clarify what Hebrews 6 would be talking about, but you can never lose your salvation. Hebrews 7, 25, Hebrews 10, 10 to 14, Makes that very clear. All right, so let's pray and we'll uh, sing our next song. Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, helping us understand um, that we can never lose our salvation, that you paid all of our sins, saved us to the uttermost, and that you have perfected forever them that are sanctified. For by one offering, God, we thank you that we are saved once for all, that moreover the law entered, the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And we thank you, God, for all that, that we will never thirst, we'll never go hungry, we'll never be plucked out of your hand. We can, uh, you cannot lose us. Lord, we just thank you that you've paid for all of our sins once through for all. Thank you, Jesus, and that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, thank you, Lord, that we are saved. So please help us to encourage each other as we see the exhortation and the warning in Hebrews that we ought to uh, provoke unto uh, love unto good works that we help each other grow in the faith and living the foundations, you know, the basic things and help us to grow, go on unto perfection, um, growing on our faith and um, not, not staying in the, the milk of the word but trying to eat of that strong meat. So pray challenge us to grow in the faith and not to be just willing to be happy with just being saved, but to do more for you, God, for you saved us, for you went through all the things that you've gone through of us, Lord. Thank you. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.